I am delighted to introduce Elise Cantu. She's a trailblazer in oncology within the PT profession. Some of you may already know, but the PT board certification of oncology wasn't even created until 2019. So Elise made a pretty wonderful accomplishment, earning her designation shortly thereafter in 2021. And since then, she's earned various accolades and certifications and has empowered other PTs pursuing this designation. Uh, she's founded the Onco PT, a platform revolutionizing patient and professional lives through podcasts, courses, and online communities. And despite her commitments to her business and her podcast, she also serves as director for Fort Worth Cancer Care as a consultant for the Pediatric Lymphedema Alliance and the Bryland's Feet Foundation. And in addition to that, she's also an adjunct professor at the Texas Christian University. So we're very privileged to have her here to speak with us today. And I'm particularly excited about Elisa's presentation as I, I have had very off the wall cases of patients with cancer. And I can say that the value of the knowledge she imparts is immeasurable. And it's crucial for healthcare professionals, including PTs, to better understand and treat patients with cancer or a history of cancer. So through this next hour, as Elise shares her expertise and profound passion for oncology, I hope that each of you leave here today with a renewed sense of purpose and determination and a readiness to make a difference in those affected by cancer. So. Without further ado, it's my distinct honor to present to you the remarkable and inspiring Elise Cantu. Well, Warren, thank you so very much for that. I mean, I don't, I feel like I have so much to live up to in that introduction, but I'm really, really excited to be here. Um, Warren and Jordan and I all went to PT school together, so it's really cool to be back in this in this capacity. So, Warren, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. If you'll just give me a little yes, you can see it, and then I'm going to dive right in because we've got a lot to cover. So, as we as we talked about, we're going to be talking about physical therapy for cancer survivors. Now. I have a colleague in this amazing oncology physical therapy world who has this saying, and she says, if you don't see cancer survivors in your practice, they see you. And I think that's a really profound way to really discuss just how pervasive prevalent cancer is in our society. And the amazing thing about all this is that at the heart of this, we are now seeing cancer survivors live for so much longer than we have ever seen before. It used to be that cancer period was a death sentence for so many of our patients, and that is not the case anymore. In fact, we're seeing so many patients who are living months, years, decades, entire lifetimes after they've undergone cancer treatment, and we as the physical therapy profession need to be equipped and prepared to treat these patients because they will come in to see us. No matter your setting, no matter your specialization, you will treat a cancer survivor at some point. And again, going back to, like I said, my good friend said, Says, it's not that you, if you'll see them, it's when you'll see them. So our objectives for tonight, we're going to understand basic information about cancer treatments and their side effects. We'll talk about the various impairments that patients can experience as a result of cancer and or its treatments, as well as some specifics on what does PT actually do for these patients experiencing these side effects and impairments. Now, cancer at its core, you're probably familiar with this because you've probably done a little bit of learning about this. Cancer is an uncontrolled cell growth, and there's actually a hundred plus diagnoses that fall under this umbrella of cancer. And so what normally happens is we have normal body cells, normal body tissues are going to replicate and divide and they'll differentiate into the various body tissues, heart, lung, et cetera. However, Cancer cells do not follow the rules that all the other cells follow. And these malignant cells, these cancerous cells, kind of do their own thing. And so what happens is, is that they mutate and they morph and they look different than their parent cells. But it's not just the looking different that's so problematic, it's the acting different that is what makes cancer so problematic. Now, during this presentation, we're going to go through some different vocabulary that's really important to understand when you're working with these cancer survivors. So we'll go through these and then we're gonna dive into what are the treatments, what are the side effects, and ultimately what the heck do we do about these as physical therapists. Now, some of you are probably familiar with cancer stage. What this refers to is basically the extent, the size of the cancer. Now, different cancers 
have slightly different terminology or stages they use to classify stage for the specific diagnosis. So breast cancer staging is not going to look exactly the same as lung cancer staging, but this is generally what I need you to appreciate when it comes to cancer stage. Most solid tumors are going to follow the TNM staging system. So that refers to tumor, lymph nodes, metastasis. And all this is referring to is how big, how widespread is the cancer? Ranging from stage zero is carcinoma in situ, extremely localized, hasn't even broken through like a membrane at that point, ranging all the way to stage four, which is also something that we refer to as metastatic cancer. And this is cancer that has spread to distant body tissues, not just elsewhere in that region, but often um, throughout other, other parts of the body. Now, grading is different, and this is sometimes kind of confusing. Remember, staging refers to the extent, the amount of widespreadness of the cancer, whereas grade refers to how aggressively the tumor is growing and replicating, how different the cancer cells look from their original origin tissue. And the reason we care about this is because the more aggressive a cancer is, the more likely it is to spread, the faster it is likely to spread. And this is directly related to our patient's prognosis and ultimately is going to help determine their treatment plan as they are working with their oncology team to determine what the heck are we going to do about this diagnosis. Now, as I've mentioned previously, there is a difference between solid and hematological tumors. Solid tumors are tumors that are going to occur in most of the body tissue. So when we think about breast cancer, lung cancer, prostate cancer, colorectal cancer, brain cancer, et cetera, those are our solid tumors. Whereas hematological cancers, these are our like liquid or blood-based cancers. Some things like leukemias, lymphomas, or even multiple myelomas. So again, as you can see, there are a lot of different cancers that fall under this cancer umbrella. Cancer is treated a variety of different ways. And even like breast cancer is one of the more common diagnoses that I'll see in my practice. Breast cancer is not breast cancer is not breast cancer. And the reason I bring this up, the reason I talk about this is no two persons cancer, even of the same type, like breast cancer, for example, no two cancers are the same. Everybody's cancer is different. And it's really interesting as we, as I've kind of dived more into this oncology world, the more apparent it is that we have so much still to learn about different individuals' cancers and how they're going to be best treated. So if you're looking at this list right now thinking, oh my God, that is so many, don't worry, friend, because there's a lot, but we're going to cover the basics of what you need to know and you can walk back into your clinic or your hospital or whatever setting tomorrow morning and feel more confident to say, I understand this a little better and I feel a little more confident that I'm gonna be able to help this patient. So common cancer treatments that we'll see for the oncology patient population include surgery, chemotherapy, radiation therapy, immunotherapy, biologic therapy. Also, you may hear the phrase targeted therapy as well. We also see sometimes hema, um, hema, hematopoietic stem cell transplants and even hormonal therapies as well. And we're gonna talk about each of those here shortly. Now surgery, I think is probably the treatment that we as physical therapists are most familiar with because we encounter patients after surgery and even before surgery for a variety of different conditions. In cancer, in oncology, Surgery is most commonly used to try and remove as much of the tumor as possible. Ideally all of it, but sometimes that's not feasible. Surgery may also be used to help reconstruct tissues. And I've got some examples coming up. And in some cases, surgery is also used to explore the patient, the patient's body to see where is the tumor, um, what is it affecting, and maybe is there anything else going on inside that we can't necessarily see with imaging. Side effects of surgery are going to mimic a lot of the other surgeries that we see, but there's some spe special considerations here. Mainly, I think where patients tend to have surgery for cancer is probably a little different than say like a knee replacement or a hip replacement, for example. So we're going to see, of, of course, scars, soft tissue mobility impairments, range of motion issues, pain, but also we can start to see this swelling and lymphedema. And I do classify those separately on purpose. And I will talk a little bit more about lymphedema coming up as well as deconditioning and weakness that of course we can see with again, a lot of our other post-surgical patients.
Now, I am going to show you some graphics and images. Um, nothing is too graphic in this presentation, so I just wanted to let you know I shouldn't be scaring you too much with this imaging. So this is an example of a colonic resection and colostomy placement for a patient who's treated with surgery for colorectal cancer. So in this case, this person had cancer in their distal colon, they had it, part of it removed, and some more, and they have created this artificial opening where this person now has a colostomy. Maybe this is a permanent thing, maybe this is a temporary thing, but again, this, it really depends on the patient as well as, again, staging and grading, so things to be aware of when you encounter the patient treated this way. Now, there's also, um, something that you may encounter is head and neck cancer. And that includes a lot of different things. But one of the things that we see commonly for patients treated for head and neck cancer is a neck dissection. Now this here is an example, two examples of something called a radical neck dissection. And if you have experience with this, you may be thinking, at least we don't really do do these anymore. And you're totally right. We actually tend to do as a medical community more of the selective neck dissection. However, that doesn't mean that you are not going to encounter patients treated for radical neck dissection because I can't tell you how many patients I've had who were treated previously for their cancer with much more radical approaches and are just now experiencing the side effects and impairments of that cancer treatment that radical neck dissection, for example, so many years ago today in 2023. So as I mentioned, we're going to see much more of selective neck dissection. As you can see in this picture here, much, it's, it's a significant scar, don't get me wrong, okay? This is, this is a big surgery. But this scar and this scar are much, much different I'm sure then you can already start to imagine and even see some of the, the symmetrical differences from the unaffected side to the affected side, unaffected to affected side in these two patients. And we'll talk a little bit more about head and neck um, cancer specifics and some upcoming slides. Now, I'm sure some of you have heard of lumpectomies, have probably maybe even seen patients undergoing lumpectomies. This is a portion of the breast tissue is removed to try and again remove as much of the tumor as possible, some patients may undergo something called a mastectomy, the removal of the full breast. And in this case, this patient has undergone a double mastectomy, removal of both breast tissue. Now there's varying levels or um, approaches when it comes to mastectomies. This one is pretty significant. Again, this patient has had all of the breast tissue taken as well as nipples and areolas. And again, while we don't see as many radical mastectomies and modified radical mastectomies, which are really extensive, aggressive mastectomies. We don't really see those done anymore, except in very significant cases. You will still potentially see a patient who was treated with that previously, now coming in to see you because they have some kind of physical therapy needs that you can address. Now, as I mentioned, surgery is also used to reconstruct tissue. This is an example of breast reconstruction, and there are a lot of different types out there. This is very region specific. Um, I've worked with a few actually surgeons in the Austin and San Antonio area. There's a lot of deep flap reconstruction done as far as I understand. It's kind of the same thing up here in Fort Worth. I also see a lot of breast implant tissue expander placements. Um, but again, your area may be a little different. This kind of depends on surgeon, um, surgeon preference. So just be aware there's lots of ways to do breast reconstruction these days, which is pretty cool. Now, deep flap reconstruction, as I mentioned, this is probably one of the more common ones we see here in Texas, again, both in the Capital Area District, but also up in the DFW Metroplex where I am. This is affectionately known as a tummy tuck and a boob job, but this really kind of understates the significance of the surgery and just how much work goes into this and how many impairments the patients can really experience after this. So what happens is the person will undergo some kind of a mastectomy, maybe that's a unilateral mastectomy or a bilateral. They take tissue from the abdomen, including the local blood supply, and this is what makes this so cool, and they reconstruct the breast tissue, again, either unilaterally, bilaterally, and they reconnect the local blood supply of this tissue flap to the local blood vessels in the chest area, which is so amazing. And this is really helpful because it can help reduce the 
failure, the flap failure patients can experience, maybe avoiding, you know, tissue death, et cetera. And it's also nice because it, it, it changes with the patient, right? Because it is the patient's own body, which for better, for worse, it's going to change with them, which is pretty cool. Now, chemotherapy, I think people hear this, but they don't really know what's going on a lot of times. What chemotherapy is, it is some kind of chemical medical therapy, and there's a lot that falls under this umbrella. But what it seeks to do at the heart of it is attack the rapidly dividing cells. Cancer cells are really, really good at dividing and replicating really, really fast. And so chemotherapy is really, really helpful for this. Chemotherapy is also a systemic treatment, meaning that it is going to be helpful for a disease that has spread elsewhere in the body, because again, cancer is really good at that, which is a problem. Unfortunately, with chemotherapy, systemic treatment means potentially systemic side effects, and that's something that we need to be aware of. So there are a lot of different side effects of chemotherapy, and I'm going to bring out my first PT saying of the evening, which is the side effects depend, it depends on the specific chemotherapy. So this is a very 30,000 foot view at the different side effects of chemotherapy. Each agent is going to be a little bit different. Some examples of chemotherapy that you may have heard of, you may have come across at one point, there's carboplatin, 5-FU or fluorouracil, paclitaxel, rituximab, cyclophosphamide, adriamycin, also known as doxorubicin, also unaffectionately known as the red devil. It is literally red in the bag when they hang it, and it, it's, it's a doozy. This is by no means all encompassing. These are just some examples of chemotherapy, and again, side effects really depend on the specific agent. Radiation therapy. I'll abbreviate this as XRT for the remainder of the presentation. The reason that we use radiation therapy is that radiation therapy, when dosed in therapeutic doses, is going to disrupt and damage DNA of the cancer cells, which means that they can no longer replicate. Because remember, cancer cells are really good at replicating, and radiation can interrupt that process and basically stop it dead in its tracks which means that the cancer cells can then be killed, which is amazing. Radiation is used for other reasons, including to shrink tumors that may not be surgically operable at time. Maybe they're shrinking them to get them to where they can be surgical, um, but also to relieve symptoms. In my patients who have metastatic cancer, sometimes radiation therapy can be very, very useful for palliative purposes, which is pretty darn cool. Side effects. It is basically like a deep sunburn. Depending on the area of the body treated with radiation is really going to dictate the various signs and symptoms, impairments that a person can experience. So if I'm thinking about the person who's treated for left-sided breast cancer and receives left-sided radiation therapy, thinking about all the tissue that happened that is is right here, right? So of course we've got our skin, we've got the fat tissue, we also have bone. Um, again, left chest here, we've got a heart, we've got some lungs, right? So there's a lot happening here. It is not just superficial when it comes to radiation. It is deep. Sometimes, I don't know if um, some of you have seen this before, sometimes there will even be exit um, darkening of the tissue where that radiation is truly going in and out. So just something to be aware of, radiation damage is not just skin deep. Couple examples of this. So this is a patient who is treated for head and neck cancer with radiation. I'm hoping that you can see this. There's some discoloration, some redness in his neck area here. I think I've got another one coming up. No, nope. okay, so this is breast radiation. And the reason I pull this up, I know this is kind of hard to see, but there is a definite darkening of the tissue here. This is a patient who has undergone radiation therapy um, and is now several weeks to months post. And there is still a darkening of tissue that is likely to remain potentially for the rest of this patient's life. Now there's also something called brachytherapy. This is an internal application of radiation therapy used for diseases such as prostate cancer, even sometimes anal rectal cancer, gynecological cancer. And again, it really just kind of depends on where are the tissues treated with radiation, but considering there's a whole lot of anatomy happening in this area. So you better believe that pelvic floor is absolutely affected by this internal radiation therapy. 
Now, hematopoietic stem cell transplants are most commonly used for more of our hematologic malignancies, right? So maybe leukemias, lymphomas, multiple myeloma. And this is basically kind of restarting the bone marrow and the immune system after a person has undergone some other form of cancer treatment. Now, side effects can be pretty significant with this. It really just kind of depends. Um, so patients will experience some kind of bone marrow suppression, sometimes severe. Um, in certain cases with a allogeneic stem cell transplant, they can maybe experience graft-versus-host disease, mucositis, nausea, vomiting. Again, it kind of depends, which I know is a really annoying answer. Now, immunotherapy and biologic therapy and targeted therapy are absolutely the new frontier of cancer treatment. I love talking about this so much. It is so dang cool. It's almost like science fiction a little bit. So basically what these new therapies do is that they harness the body's natural immune system to work at like turbo speed. They can really ramp it up to better fight against cancer because if cancer is good at one thing, it's replicating and dividing and spreading, but it is also really, really good at interfering with the body's natural immune system. So it's kind of like a one-two punch. It's growing, it's causing problems, but it also can turn off the person's ability to respond to the foreign invader, AKA cancer. Immune therapy, biologic therapy, targeted therapy, they can fight what that cancer is doing in that capacity. So this is something that we are still learning a lot about and will continue to be learning over the next couple of decades because there are literally new drugs coming out every single month. It is so, so cool, y'all. I would really encourage you to check this out because this is some cool stuff. Now, there's lots of different examples of this. There's not going to be a quiz on this at the end. These are just examples of different immunotherapies, targeted therapies, biologic therapies that you may even already be seeing. Um, for example, I have seen so many monoclonal antibodies advertised on television commercials these days, and I bet you have too. So examples, um, pembrolizumab is also known as Keytruda, nivolumumab is Optivo, Dervalum. Dervalumab, excuse me, is in Thinzy. Just keep an eye out because like I said, I bet you've encountered some of these yet and you don't even know it, which is pretty cool. And it just shows how widespread immune therapy is really becoming for a variety of disease management, not just cancer, but especially cancer. There are of course other types, not just these monoclonal antibodies that I've included here. And there's even way more y'all. Like we could do a whole eight hour presentation, but I'm not gonna keep you here for that just to talk about immune therapy. Now, other treatments that you may see, again, very dependent on the specific uh, diagnosis. Some patients may go through hormonal therapy, and in most cases, that is going to be to suppress or deplete the person's natural level of a particular hormone because their cancer responds and grows in the presence, in the environment of that hormone. So commonly, I see this in patients um, with breast, some breast cancers, some prostate cancers, and even some gynecological cancers. So to be aware, that could be a part of your patient's treatment plan. Now, all this to say, this was a bit of a crash course in cancer treatments. What we're now going to move into is more of a, let's zoom out and let's look at different impairments patients can experience that are not specific to one diagnosis. So looking at this list here and then the list on the upcoming slide, most of these side effects accompany most of my patients regardless of their diagnosis. But the good thing about all this is that we as physical therapists are so equipped to treat these because these are musculoskeletal impairments that we know how to treat. And we have skilled services that we can provide to patients to help them live a better life after a cancer diagnosis. So things I see commonly, cancer-related fatigue, weakness. I mean, who here sees weakness, am I right? I also see lymphedema, um, something called axillary web syndrome or cording, which we'll talk a little bit more about shortly, um, but also a specific type of peripheral neuropathy, balance and falls is a huge issue in this patient population. And then we'll talk a little bit about radiation fibrosis as well. Now, keeping it going, y'all, there's so many different impairments, and again, you are equipped to treat, I would say, 80% of these right off the bat. So mobility issues, range of motion issues, pain, right? Who here is treating patients with pain? 
Also something called trismus, swallowing speaking difficulties, um, chemo brain as it's not affectionately known, but also pelvic floor dysfunction. So zooming in a little bit on cancer related fatigue. This is fatigue unlike anything that you and I most likely experience. So this is the definition from the official definition from NCCN. And I really, really like this definition because it really picks out and highlights so much of why this is such a problematic and bothersome experience for our patients. Cancer-related fatigue is a distressing, persistent, subjective sense of physical, emotional, or cognitive tiredness or lethargy related to cancer pathology and or cancer treatment that is not proportional to recent physical activity and interferes with usual general functioning and ADLs loaded definition, but if we're going to back it up a little bit and just talk about some of these really key components, this is subjective, persistent, distressing. This is something that the patient experience, I cannot necessarily, like I can sometimes, but we can't always necessarily look at a patient and be like, ah, cancer-related fatigue, check that off. This is something that they experience so significantly. It is overwhelming and is not just a physical tired, it is an exhaustion that is sometimes all-encompassing, physical, emotional, mentally, and this causes a lot of problems for our patients, including their ability to do their ADLs. This is a big deal. This is not just a go take a nap and you'll feel better. This is all the dang time. There are likely a lot of factors contributing to cancer-related fatigue in our patients. We don't even fully understand why it happens for some patients, but we've got a pretty good idea. Cancer plays a role, cancer treatment plays a role, but also there are other things in the body happening that are absolutely contributing here. We would be remiss to not consider the psychological factors of this. So again, lots of layers contributing to cancer-related fatigue. About 80% of patients will experience cancer-related fatigue at some point after they've been diagnosed, even sometimes before they've been diagnosed. And 75% of patients with stage four cancer are going to experience cancer-related fatigue. This is huge. This is not necessarily an acute experience. I have patients who were treated for their cancer four years ago who are still struggling with this. This is a big deal. And guess what? We are absolutely professionals to help with this. So these are just some more kind of definitions, um, kind of a checklist of ways to screen for cancer-related fatigue. But one of the coolest things that we have seen in the research when it comes to working with these patients is that exercise is absolutely the best, most well-supported intervention for actually addressing cancer-related fatigue in patients. And I mean, again, movement, movement specialists here, right? So there are very specific exercise guidelines. Um, I'm happy to share Warren DPTA team with you after the presentation, very specific evidence-based prescriptions to help patients address this. It's really, really cool. So this helps them lessen and live with their cancer-related fatigue because one of the things that's really misunderstood about cancer-related fatigue is that typically when I'm tired, I take a nap and I feel better. Cancer-related fatigue does not respond this way. In fact, sometimes rest can actually make your fatigue worse in these cases, but exercise makes it better. And again, exercise professionals up in here. Now our next impairment, deconditioning and weakness. Again, lots of factors potentially contributing here. Maybe it's the fatigue that the patients are experiencing and then they're tired all the time and they don't wanna do something. So they get even more deconditioned in this kind of exacerbates upon itself. Sometimes cancer itself or the treatments will actually influence this. And a lot of times patients are diagnosed with cancer at older ages, not always, but a good chunk of our patients are, and they may be already experiencing some deconditioned status or weakness. So how we can help with this is again, through our exercise interventions that we are so skilled in prescribing for our patients. And I would really encourage you here, don't forget to consider balance especially in our older patients. But again, don't knock the younger patients because this is a really, really big deal, unfortunately, in this patient population. Now, chemotherapy-induced peripheral neuropathy is a little bit of a misnomer, and I apologize for it. I didn't come up with the term. But we are now seeing that there are other 
cancer treatments that are contributing to this. So there's a couple immunotherapies, targeted therapies that are also included in here. But I think CIPN is a little nicer abbreviation than figuring out chemotherapy, immunotherapy, targeted therapy, induced peripheral neuropathy. I just think that would be too much of, a, of an abbreviation. So CIPN is a type of peripheral neuropathy that is contributed to by cancer treatments. So this is some kind of a neurotoxic chemotherapy, again, as I mentioned, immunotherapy or targeted therapy. These treatments, again, like I said, the side effects really depend, but there are some agents that are very neurotoxic. They are damaging to the nerves, especially those amazing nerves that we have in our hands, our fingers, our feet, and our toes. And unfortunately, in some cases, patients may already have a pre-existing neuropathy that is just layered upon by these different cancer treatments. Patients will frequently describe these as numbness, tingling, maybe even like a burning sensation. Um, sometimes, sometimes it's painful for patients and some patients will even tell me it feels like their hands are dead. At the heart of this, again, you're gonna hear me talk about balance and falls over and over again. This is a major contributor to balance impairments and falls, especially in our oncology patient population. And again, falls are one of my big soapboxes. This is a really, really big deal. It is really easy in this patient population to just kind of let this slide under the radar. Don't let it because this can potentially have catastrophic impairments. So how we can help with this as physical therapists is we can help potentially with symptom management. Maybe we're working with patients to improve their balance and their stability and further reducing the risk of falls so that these patients aren't hurting themselves even more than what they may already be experiencing as a result of, like I said, the cancer and the treatment side effects. One thing I really like to do with these patients, if I know that they're experiencing symptoms in like their hands, their fingers, their feet, their toes, is I like to do actually some soft tissue mobilization. There's some discussion, we're still working on the research, but there's some discussion that maybe the chemotherapy, immunotherapy, targeted therapy are contributing to like the, obviously the damage of these nerves, but maybe there's even some connective tissue like tightening or scarring down around this. And so maybe some local simula simu simulation, excuse me, could be helpful in that case. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't in my practice. But again, one of the big things I really like to do with these patients is working on balance and proprioception training, but also working on what are other impairments they may be experiencing that are likely not being helped by the neuropathy. So again, strengthening aerobic conditioning, there is some evidence emerging that maybe aerobic conditioning is helping restore some blood flow to again, those distal peripheral nerves that are being impacted most by the CIPN. And then also educating patients on fall risk as well as what are strategies to, to potentially reduce the risk or altogether get rid of the risk of falls. Like I talked about balance and falls, huge issue in this patient population. We know how deadly falls are in our normally aging patient population. Cancer survivors, especially our older cancer survivors, are at a 50, like a, a two times to greater risk increase of experiencing a catastrophic fall. So this is a really, really big deal, again, already in our patient population, but in our cancer survivors, it is that much more. It's a really, really big deal. Lots of factors here. Again, maybe our patients are already experiencing balance impairments prior to the cancer diagnosis. But again, cancer and cancer treatment are not going to necessarily help this get any better. Patients can experience impaired sensation and proprioception. Again, maybe that's due to the cancer treatment. Maybe that's due to something else. Decreased strength, pre-existing um, pre vestibular problems, maybe even cognitive impairments that are contributing here. And again, I cannot overstate this. Falls are already deadly potentially, right? But they truly can be lethal in the oncology patient population and not even necessarily for the ways that we think. Of course, a person could fall and really injure themselves, of course. But maybe that fall like injured them, but now they have to go into the hospital and they're already immunosuppressed and they happen to contract some kind of an infection that absolutely decimates them. Like, the last thing we want for these patients is for them to wind up in the hospital, especially because of a fall. So again, balance and falls, major, major issue in this patient population. 
So what we're working on is working on to avoid all of this, right? So working on balance and proprioception. I really, really like to work on lower extremity strengthening exercises for these patients. Again, if there is a presence of CIPN, maybe I'm doing some soft tissue mobilization to those specific areas, aerobic conditioning. And then of course, also working with our patients and their family or their caregivers to maximize the safety in their home as much as possible to make sure that we are reducing those risk factors as much as possible. Now, radiation fibrosis is something that is very specific to being treated with radiation. It really depends on, here I go saying that again, it really depends on where the person is treated with radiation to determine what is actually going to be affected by radiation fibrosis. Now, radiation by itself can cause various long-lasting side effects, but what radiation fibrosis is, it is a syndrome of side effects that is long lasting after a person is treated with radiation. So it's kind of like this moving into this chronic experience of radiation side effects. So is this thickening of soft tissue after radiation therapy, and it can really compound on pre-existing issues patients are experiencing. So for example, I have patients, um, I work a lot with patients who are treated with breast cancer. They'll undergo a mastectomy, maybe even some kind of reconstruction. They have scars. Maybe they are already experiencing some lymphedema. And unfortunately, because radiation fibrosis is causing this toughening, this thickening of that soft tissue, it can further exacerbate the mobility issues, the range of motion issues, the flexibility issues, the scar tissue, the lymphedema that the person is already experiencing, it just layers on a whole other set of complications, unfortunately. But how we can work with these patients is we can be working with helping to mobilize that soft tissue around that area, working on flexibility, range of motion, stretching, also aerobic conditioning. Again, I know that doesn't necessarily seem super intuitive as to like, how does that help? A lot of times these patients are already deconditioned, they're weak, they are probably not exercising as much as we want to, and maybe even getting that motion right back into their bodies is really going to help them kind of loosen up that tissue as much as possible. So scar tissue, big, big thing in this world, okay? So my patients, of course, can experience a lot of soft tissue, mobiliz um, soft tissue mobility impairments. And this is due to a few different things, right? Maybe it's the surgery. Maybe it's also the radiation that they were treated with. But then we start to see that patients can be experiencing these different impairments as a result of their cancer and their cancer treatment, such as lymphedema and cording. And again, let's put a pin in that. We're going to come back to that here shortly. We know that adhesive capsulitis is an issue. And unfortunately, some of our patients treated, for example, for breast cancer are at an increased risk of developing adhesive capsulitis. Patients can also experience prior musculoskeletal issues. I mean, unfortunately, when a person is diagnosed with cancer, their other musculoskeletal impairments don't just clear up and say, oh, you know what? Cancer, we're going to take a back seat. Don't worry about us. Like, we're going to stay out of your hair. No, that is absolutely not the case. Just because a person's diagnosed with cancer doesn't mean that they don't still have musculoskeletal impairments. And unfortunately, cancer and cancer treatments can exacerbate those pre existing musculoskeletal impairments, maybe even to the point, maybe this is something you haven't considered yet, maybe even to the point that they are not able to undergo their scheduled cancer treatments. Perfect example of this. I have a young patient come in. She's going to undergo radiation therapy for her breast cancer. She already had some rotator cuff issues. She is not able to tolerate the positioning of radiation therapy. So now she can't start radiation therapy until we work on her shoulder range of motion. And that potentially has ramifications on her potential survival. So again, if it sounds I'm a little bit catastrophizing all of this, it's because it is a really big deal in this world. And again, we as physical therapists, as movement specialists are perfectly equipped to work with these patients on their musculoskeletal impairments. So some of the things that we do, this looks like a lot of stuff that we do normally in our like orthopedic or maybe even other areas of physical therapy, which is pretty cool. We already know how to do a lot of this. Pain. Pain is a big deal with this patient population. Again, maybe it's due to the musculoskeletal impairments. 
Maybe it's due to a whole lot of other things that I've listed here. One of the things I wanna to touch on briefly is cancer-related pain. Cancer-related pain is unlike anything that most of us have experienced on here. And when I mean cancer pain, I mean that the cancer has invaded a tissue that is causing the person pain. When this, when this happens, this is usually in a metastatic case. Again, a patient has um, extensive cancer that has spread to other regions. This is usually stage four that we're talking about here. Again, that language I referred to previously, all bets are off, right? We want to make sure that this patient is able to be as comfortable as possible while still being able to move. And so this patient may be on opioids or other really, really strong pain medication appropriately to dose that. Um, so a common conversation I have with my patients is because a lot of patients are really concerned. A lot of my patients are really concerned about being hooked on, on drugs, on opioids, because I think <laughs> we've done a really good job of talking about the dangers of opioids to the point that now my patients are like, I don't want to get hooked. I'm like, well, we got to have a compromise. And so this is a really important conversation to have that for these patients, this kind of pain medication is a tool that allows them to get their pain under control a little more so they can go and do the things that are important to them. So I would really encourage you to put that in your back pocket because that's a really, really important conversation I have more frequently than I thought I would be. So with pain, again, if this is a musculoskeletal issue, we're addressing that. We really, really work closely with the pain management and oncology team who are prescribing the pain management strategies, again, like medication, maybe that's opioids to help with this. Um, but one of the hardest things I think sometimes to learn as a physical therapist is we can't always fix a person's pain in these situations. Like I said, when that cancer has invaded like the bone, for example, I cannot do anything about that pain, but I can help the person be as functional as possible in the face of that pain and working with them to make sure that medically their pain is as managed as possible. Now, head and neck cancer specifics, there's a lot here. I teased this previously. I would really encourage you, look at the differences from side to side of the treated side to the untreated side for both of these patients and just how different they look and how tight this tissue looks and how really almost scarred down it is. And a lot of this has to do with both the surgical removal of this tissue and the healing process, but I would say also the very extensive radiation treatment they had and the radiation fibrosis these patients are most likely experiencing. Now, another thing, so I've showed you these pictures previously, I wanna jump ahead to something called trismus. This is a person's inability to open their mouth, a certain range, official definitions vary. Um, this is the one that I most commonly see. However, your institution may have a little different uh, definition. That's totally okay. This may be due to the treatment. This may be due to some TMJ issues, but this is a really good example of trismus. This is all the farther that a, the patient can open their mouth. They cannot open their mouth any more than this. I don't know about you, but I couldn't eat anything with that. And this is a really big issue for our patient. And so while you may not be a speech language pathologist, right, a speech therapist, there may be some musculoskeletal things that we can do, such as like if you have TMJ experience, um, I do a lot of soft tissue work with these patients too, and it's really, really helpful. So again, this is very much a head and neck cancer specific kind of impairment. Other things we might be doing, again, joint mobilizations as appropriate for these patients, maybe cervical spine, shoulder, thoracic spine, also working on, like I said, soft tissue mobilizations and then different range of motion stretching exercises. Now, just a little brief here, speaking swallowing difficulties. I know we're all PTs here, right? I don't think there's any speech therapist in the house. One of the most important things we can do is screen our patients and get them referred to the appropriate services. This is a big role that I play in the oncology field is I, as the physical therapist, am a connector. And you will be a connector a lot of times because you should be screening for these. And then again, I, I, I do not do speech therapy, but I know some really great speech therapists that I can connect my patients to. Same thing for OT, um, especially as we get into the cognitive impairment side of things. I may not necessarily be working on that as the physical therapist, but again, 
I can connect patients to the appropriate providers here. This is something that is sometimes left off a lot of times, unfortunately, like we talk about chemo brain or cancer brain, it is really, it is really significant and it really bothers patients because it does really impede their ability to do their daily activities, but also to work. And that's a really, really big issue for a lot of patients. So don't laugh this one off. I would really encourage you dive into this a little bit and get the patient the referral they need to help with this. Great news, aerobic exercise can be really, really helpful here too. So of course, we're the queen, queens and kings of that. Now, last little bit here, we'll talk about pelvic floor dysfunction. A lot of this is based on local treatments, local side effects, but there are some systemic treatments such as hormone therapy that can cause issues here. We know that pelvic floor dysfunction is also very pervasive in the general patient population. So you better believe we're also going to see that in oncology. Now this can range as far as side effects and symptoms, but remember peeing, pooping, and sex are activities of daily living. We need to be screening our patients for issues here, and we need to be getting them connected to the appropriate provider. I am not a pelvic floor physical therapist. I will not treat your pelvic floor impairments. But as a connector, it is our responsibility to screen our patients for these impairments. And if you don't treat them, get them connected with the appropriate provider who can help with this, because this is a really, really big deal. Sexuality and intimacy is such... A, an undiscussed thing in oncology. And it really, really bothers patients, especially after cancer takes and takes and takes. And sometimes they just want to get back to feeling like a human again. And this is perhaps one of the most intimate experiences for a patient. And it's really important that again, we are having these conversations and opening these doors with patients because as much, as much credit as I give the oncologist, they're amazing. They have so much on their plate and only so much time with the patient. And sometimes they don't even get to dive into this, but we can and we must. Now, just a couple notes and then we'll wrap up with some opportunity for a question and answers. Oncology patients are not always going to end up in an oncology clinic. Even in the amazing capital area district where I know there's some amazing onco PTs out there, Cancer survivors are not just only going to end up in these cancer specific places. They're going to come to your outpatient, orthopedic, pediatric, neuro, inpatient, et cetera, settings, because they are going to have musculoskeletal impairments that you can address. Now, we, you've probably heard of prehab as far as like pre, again, I keep going back to knee replacement or hip replacement. We also see prehab really starting to emerge in oncology physical therapy as well. So ideally, we are seeing the patient after they've been diagnosed before they start treatment. And that may be like a, an opportunity to kind of get them physically ready for the treatment because it can be, can be very physically taxing and ideally getting ahead of any impairments that they may be experiencing. Red flags still count, all right? I know cancer is a red flag, okay? But that doesn't mean that they don't still experience other red flags, so still screen for them. Physical activity helps these patients, and something is always better than nothing. Now, the big secret about oncology physical therapy is that there is no big secret. If you are a physical therapist, you have the skills and the knowledge to treat this oncology patient population. We are anticipating that 50% of Americans alive in 2025 will go on to develop a cancer at some point in their lifetime. It is no longer a matter of if you will encounter a cancer survivor in your practice, it is when. I'm going to say that again, because it's so, so important. It is no longer a matter of if you are going to encounter a cancer survivor in your practice, it is when. Because if you don't see them, they are still seeing you and you may not even know it. Now, I'm gonna open this up for question time. Um, I will. As if you can put your questions in the chat, of course, or if you want to, Warren, I'm going to defer to you if people come on screen for that. Just a couple resources for you. Um, I have my own podcast called the Onco PT Podcast. I would love to continue sharing this information with you. I am on all the major podcast players. I also have some freebies for you that you can download to get started learning more about this. So 
quick guide to treating patients with cancer. This is absolutely the best place to get started. If you are like, oh my God, Elise, this was so much information, but I'm really excited about it. This is your next place to start. Um, and if you're ever interested in doing your certification specialty process um, for oncology and a couple others, you have to write your case report. But I've also got a free resource for you here as well. So question, I will take your questions now. That was fantastic, Elise. There were a couple questions. Uh, one is, is CRF any different in the peds population or is it addressed any different? Oh, this is a fabulous question. So the general principles still apply here. Activity, exercise is the best way to address cancer-related fatigue as far as we know in all patient populations, pediatrics included. Now, of course, we may have to adapt how we are prescribing that physical activity, right? So I think it's a little, as a mainly adult PT, I mainly work with adult patients. It's a little easier for me to say, okay, here is the walking program that we are going to implement together. This is what it looks like. You will, of course, have to adjust that prescription to your specific patient. You know, of course, find out what they like to do. Um, and Warren, I will also share, um, if you could share this with um, the viewers later, there is an amazing resource by the, oh my gosh, ACSM. I totally just blanked on the, the acronym that they stand for, but they have a really great chart that shows you exact prescriptions for um, addressing patients' cancer-related fatigue. It's awesome. It's amazing. And then I see a, if you could share the progression, that would be great. I'm, I'm going to need a little more um, context on that, please, and then I'm happy to answer that. Any, con any concerns or recommendations for intensity of strengthening or aerobic exercises to avoid excessive fatigue? Ivan, thank you so much for asking this question because this is a really important one. In general, in general, we underdose exercise and physical activity for our cancer survivors way more than we overdose. And I know that seems like a cop-out answer, especially if you're new, if, someone here is newer to working with this patient population, we underdose so much so often because culturally we have been conditioned to think, oh, this person has cancer, they're undergoing cancer treatment, they're fragile, right? They need to rest. No, that is actually the worst thing that they could be doing. And so as far as recommendations to get started, if you're working about a patient um, you know, who is maybe undergoing cancer treatment, is done with cancer treatment, I always pick a starting point, right? What do I think the patient could do today? And then if they seem to be doing well, okay, you know what? Next time we're gonna bump it up. So there is a little bit of a, a trial and error, especially when you first start working with this patient population, but I would really, really encourage you. Very rarely am I getting to the point that I am overdoing it with my patients. I would really challenge you. And again, I, I will share that ACSM uh, guideline. I think that's also going to be helpful, but we are going to underdose way more than we overdose. We gotta, we gotta get up there. We gotta do better about that. Uh, follow up, I think it was when we were talking about fatigue and possibly walking progression. <gasps> yes, I have a walking program I can also share after this presentation. I'm happy to do that. Ooh, student question. What are the best exercises to ask patients to do on or just after their chemo days, if any, especially if they're limited to their bed? Yes. Sanjina, that is such a wonderful question. There is, Warren, I'm gonna bring in a little pediatric because I know you're super into pediatrics. There is an amazing series of um, articles that have come out about the stoplight program. So what this is, it is a, an approach for working with patients undergoing cancer treatment that is kind of based on the, the stoplight, like red light, yellow light, green light. And even though this, is, this was originally curated for pediatrics, I think it goes really, really well for our adult patients as well. So on green light days, the patients are doing good. They're feeling good, they look good. They can do a lot of things. 
And so in that case, it is very much to tolerance. Again, we're trying to dose them appropriately. We're not trying to underdose them here. Green days, they're feeling good. Let's go. Yellow days. Maybe it's those days where they're not feeling super great, but they're not feeling super terrible. So when I think of red light days, I think of patient is on the couch in bed because they are just feeling so sick. So in red light days, maybe we're doing beaded and supine exercises only, and maybe just a few, right? But you know what? Hey, every commercial break, I want you to do some ankle pumps. Something is always better than nothing. And so again, maybe I'm even, as I'm working with my patient and curating their home exercise program, maybe I'm kind of doing a, a green light program, a yellow light program, and a red light program. And again, I think that's really helpful because patients are really in tune with, you know, I'm feeling really good today. I'm really not feeling good today. So that is that would be my recommendation as far as how do you kind of balance what to do on the days they're feeling really good and on the days they're feeling really, really bad. And if you're interested in that research, um, one of the lead researchers is Lynn Tanner. Um, and again, they've had multiple articles on the stoplight program. That's really, really wonderful. Patricia, I am so sorry. I totally cut the slides on lymphedema and cordine because I was worried about going over. Thank you for bringing that to my attention because I absolutely teased that. I'm so sorry. Dr. Gobert, can you comment about, oh, sorry. Can you comment about the relationship between radiation therapy, cardiopalm, I love it, between radiation therapy and risk for cardiovascular disorders, i.e. hypertension, heart valve dysfunction, et cetera. I remember reading something about radiation heart disease. Ugh, do, you, do you know how this presents in terms of response to exercise? Absolutely. Thank you for this question, Dr. Gobert. Yes. So the short answer is there is a tremendous amount of cardiotoxicity that occurs in the oncology patient population, particularly patients who are treated with a particular class of drug chemotherapy called anthracyclines. So remember that adriamycin, doxorubicin, red devil I talked about earlier? That's a big one. So these chemotherapies are cardiotoxic, and there's others. That's just the big one that I see most often. And then on top of that, right? So if I'm talking, I'm going back to my patient who's treated for left-sided breast cancer. She's going to get treated with a few different chemotherapies, including doxorubicin, cardiotoxic, and then receive radiation therapy to the left side of the chest for her left-sided breast cancer. And that radiation therapy, as much as we try to not to, as close as we get, is still most likely going to affect the heart. And so a lot of times what we can see in these patients, especially when it comes to more long-term, right? We're talking about 10, 15, 20 plus years after they are done with their treatment, they are more likely to die from heart disease at that point from their breast cancer, which is really wild and really just highlights the important point that Dr. Gobert is talking about. So again, very much locally treated with radiation. We got to think about what is underneath the tissue, especially, like I said, left-sided chest, um, yeah, left-sided chest radiation, um, mantle radiation. That's like a whole chest radiation setup that we sometimes see. It's, it's kind of an older treatment for like lymphomas. So these patients can commonly experience like a fibrosis, stenosis, heart valve dysfunction, um, dysrhythmias, congestive heart failure even. So unfortunately, it can be very significant for these patients. We are working as a community on what is, what are ways that we can exercise to prevent this, as well as ways that we can exercise to kind of like pay, play catch up almost um, after the person is done with treatment. And we're still very much working on prescriptions for those. So yeah. Thanks so much, Elise. I mean, it's a hard one. I, I, but I really appreciate your answer. Thank you. Really yeah. enjoy. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, Linda, thank you so much. Are there any other questions? I'm sure as you can tell, I could talk about this all night. <laughs> I think and this is not a question, but just a personal note. 
you so perfectly articulated many of the sentiments that I've felt as a clinician over the years, addressing populations and, and our rampant overuse of under prescription in these populations, especially the pediatric population, uh, which I primarily see. And mm -hmm. hearing you say that, and also with older populations, perhaps having serious conversations about those ADLs that are often missed or skimmed over because of mm -hmm. inability to <laughs> have the courage to confront a, an individual yeah. or their family about the more intimate uh, acts of daily living, other factors that would cascade into <laughs> worse outcomes makes our job as PTs so influential. And, and I feel like very often we have a tendency to just undervalue our potential yes. in these populations. Yes. You know, and again, it sounds a little bit catastrophizing when I say this, but unfortunately it's because I see it so commonly and I'll kind of end with this. When patients are not able to receive their cancer treatments because they are experiencing difficulty achieving and maintaining the position for, again, like I'm thinking breast cancer, radiation therapy, arms up overhead, or patients are so weak and deconditioned to the point that they are not safe to continue receiving their chemotherapy doses, that means that they are not receiving the full dosage of their life-saving potentially chemotherapy, which absolutely has potential ramifications on their survival, y'all. So again, if it sounds like I'm going over the top, I am a little bit, but it is the reality that I see, unfortunately, with so many of my patients. And it does sometimes come down to that, like, we have to consider that our ability to intervene and work with these patients may potentially be like life or death, big picture, long term here. But I think that really just goes to emphasize how important it is that we as physical therapists are working with these patients. And I'll leave you with, you are exactly the physical therapist that your patients with cancer need because you have the knowledge, you have the skills to address musculoskeletal impairments. And these patients have them out the wazoo. You have what it takes to treat these patients. So get out there and go do it because we need you. We need you so badly. Kimberly, shoot me an email. Let's continue this conversation because that let's get, it gets a little more specific that I know we have time for. All right, last thing, um, I do have a CEU course approved in Texas. It's called Cancer Basics Course, 13 CEUs. You can find it at this website, theoncopt.com slash cancerbasics. And I really, really appreciate you. These are my references. I really, really welcome your questions. And I really, really appreciate the time that you gave me today to talk about my absolute most favorite thing in the world. So thank you so much.